Open your Bibles, if you have them with you, to Ephesians chapter 5. To Ephesians chapter 5, and I'll share with you the message that Dr. MacArthur asked me to bring. Talking about our leadership in our homes. This is a seminal issue. You know, it's interesting, several months ago, we watched a, a tragedy unfold at Penn State University, where an icon, a hero, Joe Paterno, saw everything that he had worked and lived for, for more than four decades, disintegrate right before his eyes. And, and although, if you look at his death certificate, it will say that he died of cancer, I don't think anyone would argue that what happened to him had nothing to do with it. The fact of the matter is, it, it had to contribute to the abrupt ending of the man's life. And what's astonishing about it is how quickly it happened and how absolute the response was. A man in his position should have known better, should have done more, should have, it, it, just an absolute line in the sand. You are disqualified. You lost his position, as many would in our day and age. But, but how many of us believe that had he been discovered to be an adulterer or an abusive husband or a derelict father or an absentee father or an abusive father that Penn State would have said, you're disqualified. In fact, there is no profession in our culture wherein a man would be disqualified because of his failures as a husband and a father. Except one. And that's ours. Doctors, lawyers, coaches, judges. There's a man running for president right now who's on his third wife. And regardless of your politics, the point I'm making is it's not a disqualifier, but for us, it is. We are held to a different standard, but the question is, why? Well, before we get to that, hey, here's what I've been pondering. Not only are we unique in the fact that being derelict in those responsibilities would be a disqualifier, and that separates us from everyone else in our culture everyone else in our culture. There's no one who's held to that standard. But it's even more significant to that than that. Not only is it a disqualifier if we live our lives in that way, but biblically it is a qualifier for us to be exemplary as husbands and as fathers. So, so not only on the, on the negative side can we not just fail miserably in that area and expect to stay in the positions that we have. But from a biblical perspective, in order to enter into these positions that we have, according to Titus chapter 1 and verse 6, and according to 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 3 verses 4 and 5, we're qualified for our positions based upon being exemplary husbands and exemplary fathers. Did I say perfect? Absolutely not. You can't be an example if you're a perfect husband. Pastor, I just, can, can you just help me? I, I'm struggling with what to do. I blew it with my wife, and I, I want to make that right. Can you help me with that? Wow, I really wish I could, but I have no idea what that looks like. <laughs> Pastor, can you just pray for me? Because my son, I don't think he's going to make it. Is it a terminal illness? N no. But I don't think he's going to make it. <laughs> Cannot comprehend being that angry with a child, but I'll try to pray for you. <laughs> Not perfect, but exemplary. Again, the question is, why? Does God just throw this standard out there? Absolutely not. 
And I believe if we understand this picture here in the book of Ephesians, we'll understand the significance of the marriage relationship in general and the family in general, but also why it is so significant for us. In order to understand this, I want us to look briefly at this letter more carefully. Because what I'm going to argue is that the reason that this is so important for us, not only a disqualifier but a qualifier, is because of the gospel. Not because the family is so important in and of itself, and the family is important in and of itself, but, but, but the government's important too in and of itself. But it's important because of the gospel. This is about the gospel. This is one of the many implications of the gospel. This is a picture of the gospel. That is why this is a non-negotiable for us. Now, not just because families are in trouble in our day, and families are in trouble in our day, but everybody's in trouble in our day. Families have always been in trouble. I see so many dysfunctional families around me. Really, you do? Because as far as my theology goes, there's only been one non-dysfunctional family in the history of the world, and they're the family that invented dysfunction. <laughs> to understand Ephesians chapter 5, we have to understand Ephesians. This book divided perfectly in half. The first three chapters of the book are about orthodoxy, the last three about orthopraxy. The first three about right believing, the last three about right behaving. The first three about our calling, the last three about our conduct. The first three about the indicatives, and the last three about the imperatives. And we must grasp that if we're going to understand the book of Ephesians. We have to understand the difference between the indicatives. The, the indicatives, what Christ has accomplished on our behalf to his Father's glory through the cross. That's what we find in the first half of the book. What Christ has accomplished on our behalf to the Father's glory through the cross. Those are the indicatives, that's who and what we are. In the second half, we see the imperatives. And the imperatives are how we are called and empowered and motivated to live as a direct result of the person and work of Christ. So on the one half, we see who we are. In the second half, we see who we're called, enabled, empowered, and motivated to be. And if we disjoin these two, what we end up doing is confusing what the gospel requires and what the gospel produces. And that is no gospel at all. You end up with works righteousness if you do that. What the gospel requires is repentance and faith. What the gospel produces is obedience. And so we have to keep these things in view. We have to understand this if we want to understand marriage in the fifth chapter here of this letter. Now, not only do we have the indicatives in the first half and the imperatives in the second half, but we have what I call this sort of grand indicative at the beginning of the book. Let me give this to you. And then we'll look at the major overarching indicatives in the first three chapters. That'll take us to Ephesians chapter 5, and we can understand why marriage has the significance that it does. Chapter 1, beginning of verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the uh, heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he blessed us in the beloved. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to the purpose which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time, to unite all things in him, things in heaven, things on earth. He blessed 
us. He chose us. He predestined us. He blessed us. He lavished upon us. He made known to us. What have you been told to do? Absolutely nothing. What have you been told you can do? Absolutely everything. But note these phrases, in Christ, in the beloved, in him, through Jesus Christ, in the beloved, in him, through his blood, in Christ, in him. What Christ has accomplished on our behalf to his Father's glory through the cross. That's the grand indicative here. But then at the end of each chapter, Paul gives us these overarching indicatives, and they're the key to understanding the book of Ephesians. Look at the end of chapter 1, in verse 22. And he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. The first grand indicative as we come to the end of this chapter is Christ's headship over his body. That's what this letter is about. It's about Christ's headship over his body. There's a second grand indicative that comes at the end of chapter two. Look beginning in verse 19. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. So the first overarching indicative is Christ's headship over his body. The second one, we heard about this on yesterday, is unity in Christ's body. By the way, notice that in that unity, he uses these structural uh, illustrations, and they all go to the idea of a household. They go from the idea of a household to the idea of a temple. That's important. Hold on to that. The third and final overarching indicative here is found at the end of chapter 3. That's where we find the crescendo and we know that we've reached a turning point because we have a doxology here and an amen. So look at chapter 3 beginning in verse 20. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. The third overarching indicative is the glory that the body gives to its head. You want to understand the book of Ephesians, grab these three things. Christ's headship over his body, unity in Christ's body, and the glory that the body gives to its head. You get to the second half of this letter and you hear these things and see these things again and again and again. Those are the indicatives. Those are the things that empower us, equip us, and motivate us to do all that we are commanded to do in the second half of the book. We have to have that in order. Now come with me to Ephesians chapter five and let's begin at verse 22. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. Why? For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Does this have anything to do with the superiority of men over women? Absolutely not. This has everything to do with Christ's headship over his body. Why is this significant? It's significant because in the first half, in the indicatives, one of the grand overarching indicatives of the entire book is Christ's headship over his body. We see later on in chapter 5 that marriage is a living, breathing picture, an illustration, if you will, of the relationship between Christ and his church. If this picture is going to be an accurate one and not a blasphemous one, then just as the church submits to Christ, the wife must submit to her husband. Not because of social roles, norms, and mores, not even because of the success of society, but because of the gospel. That's why it's significant. 
Now we get to the husband's part. And here's where we're going to hang out for a minute. Husbands, love your wives. Now he could stop there, but he doesn't. And by the way, there's an imperative if I ever saw one. Husbands, love your wives. That's just, how do you get away from that one? Husbands, love your wives. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't want to. <laughs> yeah, but he commanded you to. You have to love her. She's your wife. I don't even, you don't understand how bad it is, man. I, I, don't, even, I don't even see her as my wife anymore. Well, that's fine. Love your neighbor as yourself. She's your closest neighbor. She's right there beside you in the bed. You don't get more neighborly than that, all right? Well, brother, we don't, even, we, don't even, we don't even sleep together anymore. I sleep on the couch. Oh, well, that's cool because she's your sister in Christ. By this, all men will know that you're my disciples, that you have love one for another. All right. I don't even know if I'm still a Christian. Okay, I'm a Christian, but I don't think she's a Christian. That's fine. Love your enemies. And, and that would be enough, would it not? But I want you to grasp this. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Now watch what happens. And I don't think we have to force this. That he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of the water of the word. What does it mean to sanctify her? It means to set her apart as his own. That sounds like Christ's headship over his church. Keep reading. So that he might present the church to himself that he might present the church to himself, well, that sounds like it might be shadows of the unity that we read about earlier. And then, in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish, which would bring glory to her head. Love your wife, not just because he told you to, but love your wife because this is about Christ. What do you mean this is about Christ? Listen to the picture that was just painted. Your wife is a member of the body of Christ. She belongs to Christ. You love Christ with every fiber of your being. God has given your wife to you that you might be a sanctifying influence in her life so that she is more like Christ and brings more glory to Christ as a result of having been married to you than she would have had she not. That's why you do it. It's about the gospel. She belongs to him. You love him. She, God gave her to you. And God is using you as a sanctifying influence in her life. Sometimes just by how hard it is to live with you. <laughs> if you can't say amen, you ought to say ouch. <laughs> but man, does that not change your perspective? It, God is not saying, you know, reach way down deep and try to, try to find some overflowing emotion toward your wife. That's, that's, that's not what he's saying. We, we should be emotional toward our wives, but that's not what he's saying. This is about Christ. This is an adopted daughter of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. You have been united with her in a covenant relationship through which God has designed to sanctify her. Now, is this the whole of her sanctification? No, absolutely not. It's not the whole of her sanctification. But you are to be that kind of influence in her life. And because you understand Christ's headship over his body, the unity in Christ's body, and the glory that the body gives to its head, what you do is not turn to your wife in hopes that you can receive from her some motivation to love her, but turn to the Lord. See, this is not about me loving my wife so that she can in turn give me what I want. 
That's selfish. I, I'm, I'm loving you, baby. I'm loving you because, well, really, I'm loving you because I want you to give me what I want. But, but I'm loving you. That's idolatry. Pure and simple. Here's the other thing. That won't last. I'm loving my wife so that she can satisfy me. First of all, that's idolatry because she was never meant to be my satisfaction. Christ is. But secondly, she's a frail, fragile, flawed human being, and I'm going to be dissatisfied with her. So if my only reason for loving her is to increase my level of satisfaction because of how she responds, eventually I will be frustrated with that and I'll come to a, an end of myself. But if I view her as a child of the king who's been entrusted to me and my desire is that my love that overflows to her would be a sanctifying influence in her life for the love of Christ who loved me. I don't stop that. If it is about Christ, you endure for Christ's sake. Sounds really selfless, but he doesn't leave us there. In the same way, this is good, Husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. First of all, I love my wife with this kind of love because she's a member of Christ's body. But secondly, not only is she a member of his body, she's a member of mine. She's not just mine, she's me. Here's the picture. Lord, you saved me, you redeemed me, you sustained me. I love you, I'm grateful to you. You gave me this woman and a stewardship in her life. My desire is to love her in a way that draws her closer to you. Here she is, Lord, here she is. Be satisfied. And he looks to you and says, enjoy. Um, I'm giving her to you, Jesus. Yes, enjoy. She is bone of your bone, flesh of your flesh. Delight in the wife of your youth. Drink deeply from your own cistern. Enjoy. As a gift, from Christ himself. Now look at the last part of this. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother, hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see to it that she respects her husband. Now there's this picture of the one flesh union. There's this sanctifying love. There's this love that God uses in the life of a wife. It's mysterious here. Paul says it. It's mysterious. I don't understand it. She's more like him. Who do I love more than anything in the world? Christ. She becomes more radiant and more like the one whom I love more than anything else in the world. And he says to me, enjoy. Now there's, there's this picture of this one flesh union, this sexual relationship between a man and his wife. And I know there's a lot of talk going on about, you know, books out there being written about sex and so on and so forth. And so, just the language that you use and what you talk about, what you don't talk about. Let, let me give you this picture. Because I don't think we think enough of sex. I didn't say I don't think we think of sex enough. <laughs> That's not our problem but we don't think enough of sex. Marriage is this living, breathing picture of the relationship between Christ and his church. Do you know that the church is anxiously anticipating the return of her Savior? 
Do you know that the church is anxiously groaning and anticipating the consummation of all things, the wedding feast of the Lamb, the union with the one who saved us? We are anxiously anticipating that. We say, come Lord Jesus. Newsflash, the sexual union between a man and his wife is a living, breathing, awe-inspiring expression of the ecstasy of the union that the church awaits. You don't think highly enough of sex. You don't respect it enough. You don't honor it enough. There is a beauty and a glory here that we have simply missed. Now you run and tell that to your kids. You, you don't do that. Don't, don't do that. Really, why, how come you don't want me to do that? Because obviously, you know, you did that. That's how we got here, so why, how come you don't want me to do that? Well, just don't do that because it's bad. Well, it's bad, but I thought it was, I mean, you, that's how we got here. But just know because it's bad. It'll be good. What, you want, but right now it's just bad. No, listen to me, son. It is glorious, and it is a glorious manifestation of the ecstasy which the church awaits as her head and her groom returns for her. Don't you dare make less of it than that. I don't want you to be afraid of it. I don't want you to look down on it. Don't you dare look down on it. It's awesome. We overuse that word awesome, and most of the stuff that we say is awesome is not. Son, this is awesome. I ain't lying, man. It is. <laughs> but it's awesome because of this picture of Christ and his bride, the church, and you should no more illegitimately unite yourself physically with a woman outside of marriage than Christ should unite himself with one who is not his own. Different answer. Last part of this. I had a couple minutes left. Listen, it's chapter 6. Now, flowing from that, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. We're not just talking about marriage, but we're also talking about family and raising our children. Remember those qualifications that we have in Titus 1 6 have to do with our children. In 1 Timothy chapter uh, 3, verses 4 and 5, has to do with our governance of our home. Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise. It's the only one with a promise. That it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. It flows naturally from the marriage relationship and the one flesh union. What is produced by the marriage relationship and the one flesh union? What is produced by it is offspring. There's the picture. You go to Genesis chapter 2 and verse 18, and all of a sudden you've seen this pattern. For six days of creation, let there be, then there was, it was good. Let there be, then there was, it was good. Let there be, then there was, it was good. Let there be, then there was, it was good. You get used to that, and you just kind of get into the rhythm of it. Now you get in chapter 2 and verse 18, and for the first time, God says something is not good. What's not good? Not good for the man to be alone. Really? Does that mean that every man has to be married? No. It can't mean that. We know from 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and Matthew chapter 19 that it cannot mean that every man has to be married. What does it mean? That the triune God of the universe, the importance of the Trinity here, makes man in his image and then says it's not good for the man to be alone. The, 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 the God of the universe, the one true and living God who has existed eternally in three persons, the Son, eternally begotten of the Father, and the Spirit eternally proceeding from the Father and the Son makes man in his image and says, that's not good. Then from the man he makes a woman and from their union they produce offspring. Every time I talk about this, I get guys who go, well, wait a minute. Well, well, well then the single guy, a single guy doesn't have that picture. Yeah, absolutely he does. Yeah, but he doesn't have a wife and children. Yeah, but he is a child from a one flesh union. 
every human being reflects that triunity in God. And the offspring from our union reflects that. But more importantly than that, God sends to our home souls who do not know him. What, what, we say that God's called us to the gospel ministry so that we can preach the gospel to every creature and God sends us souls in our home every day. Not every day, every day. That's beyond every day. <laughs> who do not know him. Listen to me. A man who does not take great care to nurture, evangelize, and disciple the children in his home has no business in pastoral ministry. You gotta be kept up at night over lost kids, burdened over children who do not yet know him, crying out to God on their behalf, what should weigh on you more than this? And yet, here's the irony. This is supposed to be the only place where failure in this area disqualifies you and being exemplary in this area qualifies you. The overwhelming majority of churches that I'm aware of don't even ask a man about his marriage and his discipleship of his children. We don't care. Do you know what's wrong with that? Here's what's wrong with that. This is about the gospel. This is about the Christ whom we say we love and we serve. And Christ who loves his church says through his apostles, when you consider a man, look at how he shepherds his wife, look at how he shepherds his children, because if he's failing there, he's already told you he can't do this job. But what do we say? What his credentials look like? What does he sound like? as a public speaker. Give us more men who are passionate for the souls of their children and passionate about the picture of the gospel that's being painted in their relationship with their wife. Give us more men like that. Folks, we got enough seminary men. I, I, I stand before you as a seminary man. I have more degrees than a thermometer. <laughs> but you and I both know that the world is filled with seminary men who shouldn't be allowed close to a pulpit. But this is the picture. This is significant. And it's significant because of Christ's headship over his body that is pictured in the relationship between a husband and his wife as a wife lovingly submits to her husband as unto the Lord. It's a picture of the unity in Christ's body as husband and wife in spite of their sinfulness. Strive because of what Christ has accomplished on their behalf to the Father's glory. Strive, motivated by that and empowered by that to live with one another in that one flesh union in a God-honoring way. And as God blesses them with children and they strive to present the gospel to them consistently and passionately with a view towards seeing them come to faith in Christ that we might also say with our children here. Because I love you more than anything in the world. You gave them to me and I love them and I want them to be yours. This is not about the culture having better marriages. 
though I'm all for that. This is not about the world thinking better of us, though I'm all for that. This is about the gospel. Here's why this is important. And I'll close with this. Oftentimes when I talk about these issues of of marriage and family, what, what I hear from men consistently is this, but you don't know how bad it is out there and men have not seen examples. Therefore, they do not know how to be husbands and fathers. I I don't do real well with that. I I mean, really, I just don't. I don't do real well with that. I'll just be honest with you. I don't do real well with that. Pray for me, because I don't. I don't do real well with that for a couple of reasons. One, because I was raised not far from here and drug-infested, gang-infested, South Central Los Angeles, California, raised by a single teenage Buddhist mother. Never heard the gospel till my first year in college. My wife and I, who've been married for 23 years, on both sides of our family combined, there have been 25 marriages in the last two generations, 25 marriages and 22 divorces. I have 26 first cousins. There are two besides me currently married to and living with a spouse. My paternal grandmother and grandfather lived next door to each other, had three children, and were not married one day. That cannot be an excuse for me to fail as a father. Here's the second reason. I am a born again blood-washed follower of the Lord Jesus Christ who has given me the only perfect picture that any man has ever seen or ever needs to see. I do not need an imperfect human man to show me what it means to be a father because I have the perfect God-man who not only shows me that, but lives inside of me and empowers me to be what he's called me to be. Am I that perfectly? No, I'm not that perfectly. Better today than yesterday and better tomorrow than today. Not because of pulling myself up by my own bootstraps, but because I am kept and sustained by Christ. I keep my face before him. And as his glorious radiance shines upon me, I see what it means to be a man, to be a husband, and to be a father. I recognize that I cannot do this in and of myself, but in Christ, in him, through him, by his blood, in him. There's nothing that he calls me to, for which he will not equip me and through which he will not see me. My God is able. Amen. Amen. And that's ours. Doctors, lawyers, coaches, judges. There's a man running for president right now who's on his third wife. And regardless of your politics, the point I'm making is, it's not a disqualifier. But for us, it is. We are held to a different standard. But the question is, why? Well, before we get to that, here's what I've been pondering. Not only are we unique in the fact that being derelict in those responsibilities would be a disqualifier, and that separates us from everyone else. And, and although, if you look at his death certificate, it will say that he died of cancer, I don't think anyone would argue that what happened to him had nothing to do with it. The fact of the matter is, it, it had to contribute to the abrupt ending of the man's life. And what's astonishing about it 
is how quickly it happened and how absolute the response was. A man in his position should have known better, should have done more, should have, it, it, just an absolute line in the sand. You are disqualified. You lost his position, as many would in our day and age. But, but how many of us believe that had he been discovered to be an adulterer or an abusive husband or a derelict father or an absentee father or an abusive father at Penn State would have said, you're disqualified. In fact, there is no profession in our culture wherein a man would be disqualified because of his failures as a husband and a father, except one. In our culture, everyone else in our culture, there's no one who's held to that standard. But it's even more significant to that than that. Not only is it a disqualifier if we live our lives in that way, but biblically it is a qualifier for us to be exemplary as husbands and as fathers. So, so not only on the, on the negative side can we not just fail miserably in that area and expect to stay in the positions that we have, but from a biblical perspective, in order to enter into these positions that we have, according to Titus chapter 1 and verse 6, and according to 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 3 verses 4 and 5, Open your Bibles, if you have them with you, to Ephesians chapter 5, to Ephesians chapter 5, and I'll share with you the message that Dr. MacArthur asked me to bring, talking about our leadership in our homes. This is a seminal issue. You know, it's interesting, several months ago, we watched a, a tragedy unfold at Penn State University, where an icon, a hero, Joe Paterno, saw everything that he had worked and lived for for more than four decades disintegrate right before his eyes. 